Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to a uh, little book of Lamentations. It comes right behind Jeremiah. We have, um, up in our Sunday school class, just started a series on Jeremiah and Lamentations. And uh, as you read through that book, there, there's just so many great things about this man. Pastor last week was talking about just ordinary men being used in a great way. You want to know what an ordinary man is like? Read Jeremiah and Lamentations. A caring, caring individual that faced some difficult times of storm throughout his um, prophetic ministry as a prophet. Jeremiah chapter 1, and if you notice there was a theme to the music uh, with the storms this morning, a little bit, but uh, Lamentations, Lamentations, I'm sorry, Lamentations 1, we'll begin reading in verse 1. This is how doth the city sit solitary. There was full of people. How has she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces? How has she become a tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheek. Among all her lovers she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her, and they are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction, and because of the great servitude she dwelleth among the heathen. heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The way of Zion, the ways of Zion do mourn, because none come to the solemn feast. All of her gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief, her enemies prosper, for the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Imagine for a moment the story played out like this. Smoke-filled streets. A woman in her cry of anguish echoing off the flame-scorched walls as her husband falls dead at her feet. The soldiers pulling the blood-stained sword from the man's chest and then thrusting it into hers. And on another street corner, soldiers ripping babies from their mothers, from their mother's arms and throwing them against the stone walls. Hard to believe something like this would happen, isn't it? And yet, that's what we find true in the book of Jeremiah. Which leads us to this. Devastation uh, races through Jerusalem. Uh, Babylonian armies ravaged its way through the cities. Bodies left in the streets. The horrible sights and sounds and the stench. But Jeremiah, understanding that all of this, everything that they're facing, comes from the hand of God. And so he says with, with conviction... Later on in this book, we'll look at this in just a few moments, his compassions fail not. Talking about God, his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Jeremiah is a man that teaches us how to have faith through storms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises. We thank you, God, that, that when things come that seem just plain too difficult to handle. We know that there's nothing that catches you by accident. Each and every one of these things are from your very hand. And Father, you will give us the ability to stand firm and strong and true in the midst of these difficult storms that come into our lives. 
Use this vessel, use your word. Challenge us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, storms bring calamity. As as you can see, obviously, here in uh, Jeremiah was suffering in the midst of what was terrible, calamity. A few verses we we read are just a glimpse of the devastation and destruction that was going on during the time of this prophet, Jeremiah. You think about our own country. We just celebrated a couple days ago the 12-year anniversary of 9-11. And what a horrible thing that was that our country dealt with. And now 12 years later, Some have forgotten. Others still remember, but it was a thing of the past. We have seen over the years since that, terrible things happen to other parts of the country, hurricanes and terrible storms and tornadoes, and and now wildfires out west. And even just this past few days, the torrential rains in Colorado washing out streets and people dying because of these things. And we think, how terrible, how can we handle anything more? And yet, when you look at these two little books, nothing compares to what Jeremiah was facing. In Jeremiah's case, the circumstances are different, obviously. The nation of Israel being punished for its sin against God, Almighty God, They had willfully broken the covenant that they had made with God back in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And and, and God promised them terrible times, terrible calamity if they broke his covenant. And the calamity had come to pass because God is a God who we better know today keeps his word. And now Jeremiah, who was suffering along with the rest of the nation, even though He was one of God's faithful. He still had to deal with these things in his own life. They're happening all around him. And I hope we understand that that calamities will come into our own lives. And don't, don't take this the wrong way. Not all calamity comes as a result of sin. Some does. But some are just God giving us things to try us and to build us and to strengthen us. He allows us to to experience the consequences of sometimes our own sin, sometimes not. Scripture clearly says that that the Lord will judge his people and the judgment begins with the very household of God. That's you and I. But God also allows us to experience the refiner's fire as well. These storms are allowed by a loving God. Heavenly Father, to strengthen our faith, to mature us, and to ultimately bring glory to himself. We were sharing just the other night in in class that sometimes difficult things come for no other reason than to bring glory to God. We don't always understand, we may not understand, we, we may never understand, but we need to know that they come to bring glory to God himself. You know, it's often tempting to, to, to look at others and to look at the difficulty that's, that's happening in their life. And, and we try to figure out, as we, we have seen the same kind of thing in, store, in, in uh, the Bible, somebody dealing with something difficult and you wonder, oh, I wonder what they did to deserve that. What's God punishing them for? And yet you find the same kind of example. I think Pastor mentioned this last week, the blind man. Who hath sinned? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And God says neither. This man was born from birth to bring glory to me. We need to remember not to get caught in the trap of speculating on what God is doing in someone else's life. It's presumptuous if if we're looking at at, at other Christians and assuming that we know the mind of God. We know what God is doing. What we can do is we can pray. We can pray for God and His will to be accomplished in the lives of those that are facing 
this time of storm. I was talking to uh, my mom last night on, on the phone, and, and, uh, and we know some people in Colorado that, that were affected by those storms. And I know those people well, and I know their lifestyle, and I know that I could look at it and say, they're getting what they deserve, but that's not necessarily the case. We have to be careful in those things. We also have to remember that that if we aren't personally experiencing a storm right now, just beware. You might, down the road a little while, deal with something that you you, you think is, is impossible to handle. We return to Jeremiah. Jeremiah himself, a faithful servant of God, a prophet experiencing all of this horrible calamity and, 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 and this horrible time, none of it due to his own personal sin, yet allowed by a sovereign God. Later, while, while he was surveying the, the smoldering ruins, he's on the site, he's on scene, Jeremiah writes something incredible. With the grief still, still sticking in his throat, this, this prophet, known as the, as the weeping prophet, writes some things that, that some might call absurd. That verse we talked about early in the, uh, the introduction, Lamentations 3. It says in, in verse 20, My soul hath him still in remembrance, and is humbled in me. This I recall to mind. As he's thinking about these very things, He says in verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. You know, I, I look at this and, and I, I, you want to shout out and say, wait a minute, where are you coming from, Jeremiah? Can't you see what's happening? Yeah, he sees it very clearly. Different than we would respond because we would see it from our own perspective. <coughs> Jeremiah is seeing it from God's perspective. What a difference that makes. We might look and say, you know, you're crazy. Wash the blood from the streets. Bury the children. Bury the parents. And how can you say that God is in the midst of all of this? You know, that's a question that's been asked for centuries. How can God allow such a thing to happen. It's almost as if we're saying, don't mock my heartache with all this talk of God. And that's the way the world approaches things. And that's the way we would approach things if we aren't directly in tune with what God might be trying to accomplish. Was Jeremiah crazy? Or did he have something that needed to be said? When a drunk driver kills a a family member, when divorce destroys a family. I was just listening to to a um, um, a story on the radio the other day about a, a man driving home from a wedding, driving across Kansas. This happened 10 years ago, this very week. Driving across Kansas, Torrential rains, just as we've heard in Colorado, and turns to see a six-foot wall of water. Flash flood. Any of you ever seen a flash flood? I've seen them a couple times, not to this scale, but three or four feet. Six-foot wall of water comes, wipes out his car, kills his wife and his four children. He lives alone. He survived. Cancer 
in a young child, we're, we're, we're looking at this one. Where is God? And yet, we need to be saying, great is your faithfulness. Storms bring calamity. But storms also, number two, increase confidence. In the midst of storms, it is possible for some of us just plain old ordinary people to stand and face storms, calamity, difficult times with confidence and faith like Jeremiah did. It is possible. I know I, I use this story all the time, so pardon me. You've heard this one a hundred times. I love this story, Horatio Spafford. A well-known Christian lawyer in Chicago. Great holdings in real estate. However, in 1871, he lost his only son to illness. You think, how terrible. Four months later, the great Chicago fire destroyed his business and all of his properties. You say, not fair. And in a matter of hours, his, everything he had was gone. Except his family that was left. Two years later, November of 1873, Spafford and his wife and his four daughters booked passage on a ship bound for England. And just before they were, were to leave, as you remember the story, Horatio Spafford had to stay behind. But he sent his wife and his, his daughters on to England, said, I'll catch up with you in just a few days. She decided to go ahead but during the voyage, the ship collided with another vessel and sank, taking with her most of them that were on board. Mrs. Spafford was found barely alive and was taken on to England where she was able to send this short message to her husband back in Chicago. It read, saved alone. Four daughters lost in the sea. When receiving the message, he, he, the, the tragedy of everything that he had faced was now upon him. He boards the ship, heads out to sea, and when the captain got to the very area that the collision happened and his four daughters died, he stopped. And Sp uh, Spafford went and stood on the, the deck of the ship. And you know, an amazing thing happened. He received a calm, sustaining comfort from God. And that was when he was able to write these words that we just sang a few moments ago. When peace like a river attends my way, sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, God, you've taught me to say, it's okay, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and he alone has shed his own blood for my soul. For more than a century now, millions and millions of people have read this and have heard this story and it's been able to touch their lives because of what one individual went through. And we are able to say when difficult times come, when storms come, when calamities come, it's okay. It is well with my soul. Even today we hear of great heroes of faith, those who have come face to face with death, those who have lived with physical disabilities. Um, I was just given a book the other day, a, a, a man, we were talking about this and it was Jeannie Frisk gave me a book about a man with no arms, no legs. And you think, how horrible but this man is being used greatly of God. I shared this, this man, uh, Robert Rogers, who, who lost his, his wife and, and, and four children. He thought there was nothing more. He was involved in ministry in his church, and there's nothing more I can do. Dropped out of everything. But then realized that it was at the very hand of God that these things came. God brought another woman into his life, he had four children. He lost two boys, two girls. God gave him two boys and two girls, more. 
the very hand of God. How do they do it? By having confidence in God, a God who never fails, a God who, who, who is always, always there, will never leave them, never forsake them. Theirs was not a faith born overnight in a hospital room <coughs> or on the deck of a ship or in the midst of massive destruction. Faith comes as a choice that each and every one of us have to make. The choice to choose and to trust God with all the confidence that he can give while in the middle of these difficult storms of life. We all go through storms, maybe not to this extent, but we all go through things. We might think our things are difficult, and maybe they are at that moment. But is God greater than all of these things? Is it possible for us to, to have a faith like Jeremiah? We don't have to wait, you see, for storms to come. We must be diligent now in our relationship with him and be prepared and ready for when they do come into our lives. Romans 10, 17 says, says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And since this is the case, and we can learn how to endure these difficult times and how to deal with these difficult times, why would we want to spend our time, waste our time with anything else but the desire to be in the word of God and to be in in church where we can hear the word of God preached and taught. Why would we want to fill our time with anything else? We live in a time, a day, an age, a generation that wastes so much time. We were talking the other night in, in Wednesday night class, our accountability to God and, and, and prioritizing God in our lives. And if we were really honest and sat down and looked at our schedule books, whoops, where is God? We've got it so packed full of, of things about us. But where is God? Where can we learn the very things that God is trying to teach us when our, when our life is, is filled with, with sports and, and computer games and Facebook and, and, and Candy Crush and I don't know what all the other stuff is that you all play and are involved with? I see some smiling. You know what I'm talking about. They're time wasters. They're fun. But man, we can get caught up in these things and we can let, let sports rule our lives. Where is God? Where is, is the, the learning, the, the time in His Word to learn how to handle difficult times? Since we know the storms will come, no matter how big or how small, we ought to be prepared when calamity strikes, we can make sure that we have this confidence in God as we know from his word how to deal with these things. His compassions never fail. Great is thy faithfulness. Which leads us to the third and final point. Our time is almost gone. Scripture tells us time and time again that storms show us God's comfort. The comfort of God that we have in Him. Turn in your Bibles to uh, the New Testament book of 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 1. Boy, over the years of, of uh, while you're turning, being in ministry, I've seen so many times you know, you go, to, you, you go to, to help comfort someone who is, has, has faced one of these tragedies in their life. And you see the peace of God in them. The peace that God says, the peace that passes all understanding. And you're standing there thinking, I don't get it. Didn't you just, haven't you just experienced Experience. And yet you see God at work. Suffering 
Peter here is writing to the believers who are experiencing terrible storms in their lives, and they're suffering tremendous persecution under Nero. And many of these believers had had lost their lives because of their faith. And Peter's writing now to them and giving them comfort and, comfort and, and hope. And he says in 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in the heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praises and honor and glory at the the appearing of Jesus Christ. Compare this. You'll see on the board some comparisons. Jeremiah and, and what Peter is talking about here. Jeremiah faced misery and saw misery and affliction. Peter talks about manifold temptations. Jeremiah, it's, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Peter talks about God's abundant mercies. Jeremiah, I will hope in him. Peter, we have a living hope. It's Jesus Christ. Jeremiah, great is thy faithfulness. Peter, kept by the power of God. Jeremiah, quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Peter, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter tells us that the trial of our faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. And the outcome is to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ himself. Didn't we just hear that about about Peter or uh, Jeremiah in Lamentations? Same thing. The Apostle Paul says says it's an awful lot like what what Peter just told us. The Apostle Paul in in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. And and I I think, do I have that up on the the board, Troy? If uh, if not, you can take a look at that. We won't take the time right now. But uh, the same thing, 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, We know if if we suffer with Christ, we shall also reign with him. The book of Hebrews says it this way, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Or that, I'm, I'm sorry, I had those backwards there. That one's Hebrews 10.35. It's a comforting to know that whatever comes, whatever little thing, whatever big thing might come into our life, that God is always there. Some storms come and they're temporary. Some come and they're permanent. But that doesn't mean that God isn't still there. That God isn't still there able to give us comfort. Jeremiah found comfort in knowing that God was in control. His confidence in God. Thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.